problem was that whenever Adam had issues, his mother didn't want to acknowledge them, but also would avoid taking the advice of the professionals who were giving her the information that really she needed. This is Adam Lanza. On December 14th, 2012, he grabbed a rifle from his home and shot 27 people, including his own mother. Mass shooter cases can be pretty shocking. What drove the perpetrator to commit such an atrocity? What happened to them when they were children? And all the hows and whys. But what if I told you Adam Lanza's massacre could have been prevented? There were just about a million signs about his disturbed mind, including a book on cannibalism that he wrote in fifth grade. That's right, Adam had a slow but steady descend into madness, and it could have been prevented. This is what makes his story a truly tragic one. So let's explore the sad and twisted case of Adam Lanza. Today's case begins on April 22, 1992, with the birth of Adam Lanza. For the first few years of his life, he grew up in Exeter, New Hampshire, with his mother Nancy, his father Peter, and his brother Ryan, who was six years his senior. Nancy was a stockbroker and Peter was an executive. So when they started making big bucks, they decided to expand their home and move to Newtown, Connecticut in 1998. But by then, there were already some worrying signs about Adam. He was OCD, he had developmental delays, he had poor social skills per se. Adam showed obsessive, repetitive behaviors and he would only eat food if it was cooked in a very particular way. He was extremely sensitive to clothing and tags his mother had to remove all tags and wash three baskets of clothing every single day. Adam went through a full box of tissues every day, just so that he could avoid touching doorknobs. At school, he didn't really want to communicate with his peers. It seemed like he was constantly afraid of his classmates or any social activity, like playtime in the schoolyard. He also said that the lights and sounds at school made him very anxious. And as he grew up, his middle school and high school classmates would describe him as smart, but very socially awkward. He always carried a briefcase, and that's what sticks out most in my mind. But Adam had much bigger problems than a briefcase. He barely slept at night, and he hated anything stimulating, from the sounds to bright colors. Something else happened when Adam grew up. Well, he turned 16 and his parents got divorced. It wasn't a messy divorce, and Nancy got an excellent settlement, $240,000 a year. Adam Lanza's childhood and his background was relatively privileged. Although his mother and father had divorced, he had an older brother, and his mother was catered for in the alimony settlement. So Nancy could retire early and spend her whole time with her two boys. But this was a double-edged sword. Because she didn't need to work, she did, however, tend to focus a lot of her attention on Adam. And he became much more needy and codependent than his older brother. Sadly, Adam was much more than needy. He'd been diagnosed with Asperger's, and some doctors also believed that he was on the autistic spectrum. The more time passed, the more antisocial he became. He hated being touched, he didn't like social contact, he avoided having conversations and communication with children his age. You might think that a mother who has all the time in the world to care for her children might notice these things and seek help when things get out of hand. But she never did. In fact, several doctors and therapists advised her to get treatment for Adam, but she didn't respect their opinions even though they were the professionals. It seemed like she simply didn't want to admit that her son might have problems. The problem was that whenever Adam had issues, his mother didn't want to acknowledge them, but also would avoid taking the advice of the professionals who were giving her the information that really she needed to help Adam with his huge array of problems. Instead, Nancy found one way to get close to her son, guns. Yep. After the divorce, Nancy filled her house with guns and rifles. She claimed it was a way to keep herself safe as she was now the only adult in the house. But who needs dozens of guns to keep themselves safe? Nancy, Adam, and Ryan would go to shooting ranges together and spend time discussing all the kinds of guns and ammunition that they wanted to purchase in the future. It wasn't something that was seen as being a problem by his mother or his father at the time. He was very comfortable around guns. He became quite a competent shot. For Nancy, this was great. 
At least she had something in common with her son, and they could cultivate this passion together. But remember Adam's obsessive personality? Well, he became obsessed with guns, and then with violence. Adam had a fascination with guns very early on, but part of this was his relationship with his mother. And one of the fundamental connectors that Adam had in his world was with his mother and their shared interest in guns. Sadly, there was one thing that Nancy seemed to ignore completely. Um, you know, we have shooting sports uh, for a healthy kid. It, it's, it's fine. Um, and, it, and maybe early in his life, um, maybe it was OK. They, they shot as a family. She, she was born on a farm. Um, but I think the implication of your question, and I, and I agree with it, is that as he, began, as he struggled more, as he struggled to find his place in the world, as, as his contemporaries went on to college and went on to jobs, and he ended up basically sitting home, it starts to get unhealthy. Nancy never seemed to realize that Adam's behavior was becoming more worrying every year. But if this is not worrying, I don't know what is. When Adam was in fifth grade, he got an assignment at school. He was supposed to team up with another classmate and do a little comic book or an illustrated story that they would read to the rest of the class. Adam did pair up with a friend, but he did the drawings and created most of the story. What is it about, you ask? A grandma and her grandson killing children, eating humans, and making human taxidermy. Yep. This is what Adam created when he was 10 years old. The text and the drawings were extremely violent, even for an adult. It's absolutely shocking that Adam's teachers didn't bat an eyelid at this. The Office of the Child Advocate ended up writing a report on this book. Evaluation would have meant that Adam would have had the chance to discuss his thoughts and feelings. A professional could have understood his thinking and even given him the very necessary treatment. Somehow, he made it from fifth grade all the way to high school, and no one took serious action when it came to his writings and drawings. And there were lots of them. And in his bedroom, Adam kept a spreadsheet on which he explored in great detail over 400 mass killings from 1786 to the present day. He knew so much about mass murders that he even went on Wikipedia pages and corrected facts about them there. Every single sign was pointing at a worrying picture. Adam was on the path to becoming a serial killer. Adam was in high school when he decided he'd completely lost interest in attending classes. What did his mother do? He chooses not to go to school, but she's not making him. She's not doing anything to get him to go back into education. And actually, he starts to then withdraw not only from the world around him, but from his mother, from the one connecting relationship that he has. So if Nancy thought that homeschooling Adam will bring him closer to her, she was very sadly wrong. Adam soon became an outcast, spending day and night playing violent computer games and researching mass murders. By now, Adam had also cut out his father. He refused to answer his calls or text him. So essentially, we have a child living in a dark world with only access through a screen. And screens are windows to a very vast world. It's up to you what you search online. You can open your mind to a million sources of knowledge and wonder, or you can fall down a dark rabbit hole full of nasty content. Tragically, Adam became trapped in the latter. Using the internet to access the world, he became more and more interested in atrocities. He read more about mass killings, not just political mass killings and bombings, but also more mass killings that were close to home. And Adam never left behind his obsessive thoughts. Now they were completely channeled on guns, gun violence, and school shootings. By now, school shooters were his heroes, other people that wanted to be noticed and got the attention they deserved. Well, at least, that's how they seemed in his warped mind. There is something to be said about poor mothering, about cold-blooded mothering leading to problems in children. But there is also something to be said about over-mothering, about giving in to a child too much and allowing that child's perhaps darker fantasies to actually grow and become something in the real world. Indeed, it doesn't seem like Nancy ever had bad intentions. She was a rich, single mom who wanted to care for and provide for her sons in any way that they wanted. 
but the only passion she imbued on them was guns, and this had a suboptimal influence on Adam's already troubled mind. And when Adam developed crippling anorexia to the point of brain damage, Nancy still refused to seek treatment from specialists. What was up with Nancy and doctors? On December 11, 2012, Adam wrote an email about a mass shooting to an online friend. In it, he wonders about Chinese mass stabbers and the high rates of annual shootings around the globe. But look at this expert on MOs. While granting that modus operandi really isn't that important, I just can't get into vehicular slaughters. It seems too meditated, like using remote explosives, too hot. And knives stray too far from the whole mass aspect, too cold. The aesthetic of pistols seems to be just right. So this wasn't just an analysis of mass murders. He was discussing his favorite MO. If that's not one big red flag, I don't know what is. But apart from his strange friend, no one knew about this email. Adam was completely isolated by now. This is an individual who wasn't getting out much. He was learning how to conduct a spree by watching films such as Class, by watching documentaries about spree killings and learning what he should do. And Adam wasn't a social outcast because he wanted to be. It was how he felt he should be. He hated himself. He has no friends, he doesn't fit in. He doesn't like the way that he looks. We know he has anorexia, for example. He despises the community he belongs to. He despises the community who he feels has rejected him. This is the very tragic reality of many outcasts. While it's their decision to retreat from the world, they do it because they feel the world is rejecting them. It's a vicious circle that never seems to get better, unless someone intervenes. And sadly, in 2012, someone did intervene, but not in the way Adam wanted. In late 2012, Nancy sat down with her two sons and gave them a piece of news. She wanted her and Adam to move to another state. Ryan was already 26 and he had his own life in Connecticut. But in her opinion, she could have a better house somewhere else. And of course, there was no question about leaving Adam behind. We do know that shortly before the spree occurred, his mother had been discussing the idea of setting up in another town and moving herself and Adam away. But this idea was very triggering for Adam. His only sense of security came from his familiar bedroom and computer screen. And remember, he'd been diagnosed with Asperger's and possibly autism. People on the spectrum can be particularly resistant to change, and Nancy would have known this. But she didn't force Adam out of the house. In fact, she just shared her idea. She hadn't bought a place, nor had she made any concrete plans yet. However, for Adam, this was the end of the world as he knew it. That, that, that could have been the triggering agent that tipped him over the edge. On the brisk morning of December 14th, 2012, Adam woke up with a plan. He walked to the gun closet and picked up one of the largest rifles available. At around 9 a.m., he loaded it with ammunition and walked to his mother. When Adam Lanza decides that he's going to carry out the massacre, the first thing that he does is he kills his mother. Nancy barely had any time to realize what was happening. She was shot four times and fell to the floor in a big pool of blood. But Adam didn't stand to watch for too long. He had much bigger plans. First, he destroyed his computer's hard drive. Then, he equipped himself with all black clothing foam earplugs, and gloves. Next, he armed himself with a Bushmaster X-15, two sidearms, and a third shotgun. He put them all in Nancy's car and then drove it to Sandy Hook Elementary School. Interestingly, this is where Adam was once a student and also where his mother used to work as a teaching assistant. That is until Adam started to bail on school anyway. I know she had issues with school. Um, she eventually wound up homeschooling him because she battled with the school district in what capacity, I'm not 100% certain if it was behavior, if it was learning disabilities. Adam arrived at Sandy Hook a few minutes after 9.30 a.m. and the gates were already closed, but he had a plan for that too. Sandy Hook had an electronic gate system which locked at 9.30, but when he got there just after 9.30, he shot his way through a glass pane next door to the, to the gates and forced his way into the school. As soon as he entered the school, he started shooting. Within minutes, 911 received several distressing calls. Hi, I'm calling from Sandy Hook School. There's something going on at our school, and um, I, I, I just wanted to make sure someone was on okay, their way. Sandy Hook School, 
and there are some loud noises that almost sound like gunshots out in the hallway. The calls got even more blood chilling as the teachers realized what was happening, but it was one minute too late. With the Bushmaster, Adam took the lives of 20 children and six staff members. He didn't say much, he didn't engage in conversation with many of the victims, according to witnesses, but he would say things such as, look at them over there, or look at me. But predominantly, he was shooting his victims with the semi-automatic Bushmaster. At 9.40 a.m., less than 10 minutes after entering the school, Adam shot his gun one last time into his head. He collapsed dead just as the police were arriving at Sandy Hook. He killed himself just after the police had arrived and he would have heard them arriving on the scene. First it was the local police, then the state police. But he killed himself before a shot was fired by law enforcement and before even a siege or a standoff could ensue. Adam had gotten his point across and he'd made history in the worst way possible. This is what he wanted. He wasn't going to give the police officers the satisfaction of arresting him. This was one of the worst mass shootings in modern U.S. history. 20 children had died in seven minutes, and the adults who tried to save their lives were left in giant pools of blood. Newtown is a place where even the Christmas trees have been turned into shrines, and where the usual sounds of the season have been replaced by the silence of almost unspeakable grief. Adam didn't leave a note or a statement like many mass shooters do. So the Connecticut community was as devastated as it was desperate for answers. Why had Adam chosen the school as his target? And what made him descend into such madness? As the police would go on to discover his previous actions, texts, and drawings spoke volumes. It's my view that Adam Lanza actually wanted to place himself in the annals of serial killers, spree killers, mass killers. Adam wanted to make a name for himself and make himself noticed in a world that otherwise seemed to ignore him. But how is this a way to make yourself noticed? Sadly, this points to another mental illness. He was very narcissistic. He saw himself as being more precious and special than other people. Whatever was troubling him, he felt it was his justification to kill other people to prove his point. He's right. If you think it's okay to take others' lives just to make a point, there's a pretty big narcissistic problem there. Then there were his previous diagnosis, which the police only discovered by digging into Adam's history. This was when the investigators realized how little Nancy did for her son to get him the right treatment or any treatment at all. He had been diagnosed with Asperger's, and this meant he had great difficulty in social interaction and was highly sensitive to light, touch, and even eye contact. He had a reduced span of emotions, and he found it very hard to make friends. This, along with his OCD, also meant that he had a tendency to develop obsessions and fixated thinking. Quite worryingly, Adam also suffered from anxiety and depression. And as Dr. Todd Grande points out, when anxiety and depression meet with Asperger's or AST syndromes, the likelihood of violent behavior increases dramatically. Adam's untreated OCD also meant that he was left to develop even more obsessive thoughts and go down the violent tunnel that he found on the internet. And what better way to fuel an obsession with violence than a love for guns? Adam didn't just love guns, but he had constant access to them via Nancy. Furthermore, no one really knew where Nancy kept the guns. She shielded her and her son's lives from all her friends and neighbors. Uh, well, you know, we talked to, uh, one of the things about Nancy Lanza is she didn't let too many people into her home. It was something that we heard uh, very often from people that uh, she just kept people sort of at arm's length toward toward the end there. And What's particularly sad is that Nancy thought she was protecting her son from the world he found so difficult to cope with. But by locking herself up with him and by fueling his obsession for violence, she couldn't protect herself when he snapped. I think he was a lonely, broken, psychologically disordered, personality-affected individual who had been let down systematically by his mother and, to a degree, by a system that should have protected him. Nancy wanted to be a role model for her son, but what she did was enable his dark fantasies. All the while, Adam was developing other role models. One of them was Anders Breivik, who shot and killed 77 people in July 2011. Uh, investigators did find uh, news articles 
that talked about the massacre in Norway. Um, it's, it's a theory they're looking at that perhaps he did emulate um, the, the, the Norway shooter. Adam's bedroom was practically a shrine to serial killers. He had newspaper clips, journals, and spreadsheets filled with the gory details, facts and figures about mass murderers from all around the globe. Had Nancy ever seen these? Did she think this was a teenage phase? Adam was already 20 years old at the time of the shooting. He didn't have any friends, he hadn't been to school in years, and he never had a job. Living at home with a lone wolf who dedicates his whole time to studying and adoring mass killers should be pretty worrying. But Nancy didn't seem to admit this. Perhaps she didn't want to believe her son was that far gone. This is what makes this case such a sad and tragic one. He had a good, loving family and access to help, which he very much needed. And yet his myriad of problems was never addressed. Where Lanza is concerned, you just feel an absolute sense of tragedy. You know, a young man who has got so many huge problems, who hasn't had any kind of help, any kind of intervention, all the red flags have been missed. It wasn't just one or two warnings, it was a full cohort. And they started as early as his first years of life. But he was repeatedly ignored, and this might have even played a role in him feeling ignored by society as a whole. Oftentimes a red flag is a cry for help. Perhaps with the big book of Granny, Adam wanted help. He wanted his teachers or his mother to notice his disturbing thoughts and help him curb them. But no one came to his aid, and he was left alone to fend for himself in a world that he didn't understand. It's a tragic story and perhaps a lesson for parents and children alike. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you want more information on how to help against gun violence, please check out the link below to the Sandy Hook Promise, which is a national nonprofit organization founded and led by several members whose loved ones were killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Thanks for watching, you guys. Don't be shy. Click on the thumbs up button and hit that bell so you never miss another video. See you soon and keep yourself safe. It's a strange world out there.